this land to the Rocky Mountains. It's time to travel this land with Canada's singing storyteller, Wiz Bryant. This land to the Great Lakes. On today's program, Wiz tells the story of the Northwest Rebellion and Canada's most famous rebel. To some, a visionary hero. To others, a dangerous madman. The tragic tale of Louis Riel. The story of Louis Riel is the story of the Métis dream of nationhood. It began on the Canadian prairie long before Canada became a nation and ended on May 12, 1885 in a small village 50 miles north of Saskatoon in what has come to be known as the Battle of Batoche. The rail hammers They rise and they fall The construction crew sweating Keeping pace with the call With their eyes on the mountains And their hopes in their hands They cling to their hammers In an unknown land Louis Riel was born in St. Boniface, Manitoba in 1844. At 13, his deeply religious family sent him to Montreal to study for the priesthood. At 20, he joined the law firm of a Quebec radical and was soon steeped in Quebec nationalist politics and in constitutional law. In 1868, he returned to the Red River and his Métis heritage. He was 24 years old. The timing of Riel's return was prophetic, for in April of 1869, the Hudson's Bay Company ceded its rights to the Canadian prairie to the newly formed Dominion of Canada. Federal government surveyors soon appeared on the Métis farms along the banks of the Red River. Riel and 18 Métis confronted the surveyors and forced them to leave. Riel then became the spokesperson for the newly formed National Committee of the Métis. Concerned for the rights of his threatened people, Riel and 120 Métis occupied the Hudson Bay Company's Fort Garry. Here Riel set to work with the Métis Council drawing up a list of rights to be respected when their country was annexed to Canada. One of the most important rights he sought to secure was that both French and English be spoken in the Manitoba legislature. John Schultz was the leader of a small group of English Canadians who were violently opposed to Riel and his National Committee of Métis. From his Winnipeg store, he inflamed his supporters. He advocated that they attack Riel and soon turned his store into an armory. But Riel struck first. With 200 Métis, he surrounded Schultz's store and demanded surrender. Schultz and 45 others were imprisoned at Fort Garry. Among those imprisoned was one Thomas Scott, a man known for his hatred of both Catholics and Métis. Riel declared a provisional government and awaited developments from the government of Canada. But then, John Schultz and Thomas Scott escaped from Fort Garry. Thomas Scott was recaptured and executed by Riel. John Schultz fled to Ontario, where he toured communities in flaming, loyal English Protestants to avenge Scott's death. Thus, the murderous Thomas Scott became both hero and martyr. On May 21, 1869, Colonel Garnet Wolseley left Toronto for the Red River Valley. With him marched 1,200 men, 800 of whom were volunteers. When he arrived at Fort Garry, Riel had fled. Yet Riel had won his constitutional battle. In July of 1870, the Red River District became the province of Manitoba. It, its name, chosen by Riel, means the spirit that speaks. Riel was elected three times to the Canadian Parliament as member for the Manitoba constituency of Provencher. But the Ontario government had declared him an outlaw, and he could not take his seat. In 1874, Riel traveled to Ottawa and signed the Register of Members. Ottawa citizens were on fire with hatred at the thought of Riel appearing in Parliament. At the next session, over a hundred citizens appeared in the public galleries at the House of Commons hidden in their coats, loaded revolvers, waiting for Riel to appear. 
but Louis Riel fled once again. The architect of a people's dream branded for life an outlaw. Ten years passed before Riel appeared again on Canada's political landscape. The Métis had been pushed westward. The buffalo herds had vanished from the prairie. Indian and Métis were on the verge of starvation, and their free nomadic way of life was disappearing forever. The year was 1884. Riel, now married with two small children, was 39 years old. He was a school teacher in a small, isolated town in northern Montana. On Sunday, June 4th, after the morning service, Riel stood watching the prairie horizon. Suddenly, four riders appeared. It was Gabriel Dumont, famed leader of the buffalo hunts, and three Métis. They had come to ask Riel to lead them. John A. Macdonald, Prime Minister of Canada, was busy building his national dream symbolized by the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. The Métis on the Saskatchewan Prairie were struggling for some form of protection for their land titles and some form of self-government. They were being ignored. The Métis needed an articulate, powerful voice that would be heard in Ottawa. Louis Riel was that voice. For the settlers will follow To your last hunting ground With their cities and factories They will tear your life down Riel left Montana with his wife and children and meager possessions and rode north with Dumont and the Métis. It took four weeks to complete the journey. And one day as they were traveling, Riel saw a strange and frightening vision. It was a gallows on the hill. Throughout 1884, Riel worked on a petition listing the grievances of the Métis, Indians, and white settlers. His skill in constitutional law once again employed. The petition arrived in Ottawa in mid-December, but the government ignored it. John A. Macdonald, in fact, denied ever receiving it. On March 18, 1885, Louis Riel occupied the Roman Catholic Church of St. Antoine de Pado and declared a provisional government in Saskatchewan. Now Ottawa paid attention. They had their own government in Saskatchewan. Riel's act was considered rebellion. Riel sent his military leader, Gabriel Dumont, to confront the Northwest Mounted Police at Fort Carleton. Dumont employed his Métis sharpshooters in a coulee near Duck Lake. <laughs> and 12 mounted and volunteers were killed. On March 30th, 200 Cree, under Chief Poundmaker, attacked Battleford, Saskatchewan. Meanwhile, Big Bear's band of Cree had massacred nine whites at Frog Lake. As far away as Edmonton, Alberta, terrified white settlers took shelter in police and Hudson Bay Company forts. As the rebellion spread throughout the Northwest and the warfare escalated, Riel, became more and more preoccupied with his religion. He began to interfere with the brilliant guerrilla strategy of his general, Gabriel Dumont. Dumont wished to demoralize the armies of General Middleton as they marched, but Riel insisted they make their stand at Batoche. 300 Métis sharpshooters dug into four-foot rifle pits in front of the church. They faced an army of 850 equipped with Gatling guns. For four days, the battle raged. In black suit and moccasins, unarmed and carrying a cross, Riel strode among the rifle pits, heedless of the enemy fire. In the end, the Métis, without ammunition, began shooting rocks and nails. But the Métis dream of nationhood was at an end. The soldiers charged, and it was over. Gabriel Dumont escaped to the United States. He was later granted amnesty and appeared in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. The natives were forced onto reservations, and Louis Riel, architect of the Métis Dream and the province of Manitoba, was taken to Regina to stand trial. His one hope for escaping the gallows was a plea of insanity, but Riel was not insane. His brilliant and eloquent defense of his initiatives brought him execution by hanging in November of 1885. The voice of the Métis prophet was silenced forever.
Like construction crews sweating Keeping pace with the cold With their eyes on the mountains And their hopes in their hands They cling to their hammers In an unknown land And the telegraph tapping and sending a plea Asking for justice For the Cree and Métis The Mountie stands crying On the silent frontier Still the government falters Refuses to hear Travel this land, travel this land, take my